good morning from St. Peter's Episcopal Church in South Windsor, and it looks like I'm a little too close here. Um, South Windsor, Connecticut, I am Ann Fraley, the rector at St. Peter's. Welcome, we're so glad you're here this morning to worship with us. If you're following in the Book of Common Prayer, we are on page 351. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever, amen. Jesus said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. We continue with the confession found on page 352 in the prayer book or at the bottom of the first page of your order of service. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. We continue with the collect of the day. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the readings. I'm going to go ahead and read the first one. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of Israel, the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Our psalm today is Psalm 138, found on page 793 in the Red Prayer Book. We'll read this psalm together. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name because of your love and faithfulness. For you have glorified your name and your word above all things. When I called, you answered me. 
you increased my strength within me. All the kings of the earth will praise you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. They will sing of the ways of the Lord. That great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be high, he cares for the lowly. He perceives the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. The Lord will make good his purpose for me. O Lord, your love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. The second reading today is from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you, as of first importance, what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are, who are, whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of the fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts always be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Once upon a time, when I was in a corporate world, working in corporate America, I was promoted to a supervisory level. And as was the norm in the corporation, I got sent to a class to learn how to be a supervisor. Part of the training related to supervision had to do with performance appraisals, those things nobody really likes. 
And one of the things that it encouraged for the supervisor evaluating someone who was a subordinate reporting to me in this case, was to be mindful of what was expected of the person and also to be mindful of how well um, those expectations were met. And then there was a test that was given after all this. And one of the things that was on the test said, for instance, um, so-and-so um, did this particular thing, um, what do you do, exceeds expectations. And one of the things, and it had an example of the task at hand, and one of the things that I had evaluated in my test on this thing was to say the person not only did their job in this particular thing, performed a task in a particular way, but they exceeded it because they did so well. And it turned out that that was not necessarily the right way to evaluate the performance. That if, the, if what somebody did really well happened to be, um, you know, on a scale of things, a lesser function of their particular job didn't matter how well they did it. What mattered was how well they did the things that were expected of them first. Sort of like um, if you're going to be uh, a nanny, the thing that's most important is the care of your children in your charge. So if you do other things well, like if you're really good at vacuuming and cleaning windows, you might exceed expectations there, but you were hired first to be a nanny. So I should have offered that example, throw in the mix. So now we, let's, let's turn all that and focus on a little bit, use that to look at today's gospel text for a second. Jesus goes out into the boat with Simon, Peter, and James, and John, and he said, let's go out and catch some fish. And they kind of groan and say, but we've done that. That's our job, okay, exceeding expectations. That's our job, to catch fish. And Jesus presses and says, let's try again. And sure enough, a little extra effort, a little additional support from the boss in this case, and they're able to pull in all kinds of fish. So why does that matter? What does this have to do with performance appraisal? What does that have to do with uh, any of the fishermen doing what they always do and doing it well? Well, because in this particular case, they had done all those things. They had, they had exceeded expectations in the sense that they'd gone out and cast their nets and did what they always did. Hold that thought. They did what they always did, and it hadn't fulfilled the obligation. They hadn't caught the fish. And it isn't so much that Jesus comes in and says, you need to try again. You didn't do well enough the first time. Instead, it's a matter of sometimes we get so used to doing those things even that we're good at and simply going through those tasks they've always worked and then all of a sudden they don't work. How do we respond to that? So case in point here and now, the church. We know how to do church. We know how to worship. We know how to love each other, pray for each other. And then whammo, the pandemic hits and all of a sudden, the norms of our life as a church, as a worshiping community, got pulled away from us. And all of a sudden, we couldn't just go, well, I'm going to go to church and just, you know, nobody's going to be here, but I'm going to preach as though somebody were. No. We had to adapt. We had to look at other ways to accomplish what we're here to do. We did that. We got this technology. We stream on Facebook. We're trying to incorporate additional technology um, so that when we're back in the sanctuary, things can kind of be seamless in the transition from one way of going about this business and into a different way. It, it, cont it offers us the opportunity to look with fresh eyes, not because we just decide, oh, you know what, let's look at things differently one day, but because we had to. In the same way that James and John and Simon they were out not catching fish, and they could have stepped back and said, we need to think about this differently. Maybe it's timing. Maybe it's location on the boat. Maybe there's something else going on that we need to pay attention to that it will help us evaluate how to do our job, which we're good at doing. In this particular case, Jesus shows up and says, let's just keep at it. Let's, let's just give it a whirl. And it works. Now, according to the story, it isn't that they do anything new or different or figuring out how to adapt. 
but it's still an object lesson for us about how in our life of faith, when we go about what we're always doing, and suddenly it doesn't work anymore the same way we'd hoped it would. Maybe, for instance, our prayer life, whereas once we felt really connected to God and had a particular way of going about prayers, all of a sudden we're just not feeling that same connection. Do we keep doing what we've always done, perhaps? Or do we say, maybe there's some other ways I could pray. Let me try those and see what happens. More often than not, finding another way to pray is likely going to be the way that we will experience that reconnection to God. Think of it a little bit as like outgrowing clothes. Yeah, we can struggle to fit into something that doesn't fit us anymore and be really uncomfortable. And functionally, maybe we'll be protected and warm. Or maybe we need to say, it's time for some other clothes. In all kinds of ways in our lives, we do what we've always done and things work and then one day they don't work as well as they did. How might Jesus help us in those circumstances to figure out a way to continue to be who we are and yet be more of or grow into a different way of being because all of us are called to stretch and grow and learn and be transformed, to be redeemed, to experience a different way of offering who we are in the world. Maybe our relationships change, maybe our workplace changes, certainly with our kids, we graduate from high school and if we're going off to college, we're in a whole new environment there. All kinds of ways to figure out, I know how to do this, but it's not the same as it was. What we do is we dig deep into who we are because God is going to use who we are and where it's possible, we learn new skills and figure out where those things work and what we can learn and maybe shine and thrive in those new things. And here's another thing. If we don't quite have what it takes to get a job done, chances are somebody around us does. Called teamwork. I had a boss once upon a time, my very first rector boss, who, although he was really good at a whole bunch of things, there were places that just weren't his strong suit. And I heard over and over again from other members of the church and other staff, Jim's really good at knowing where he's not good. And so he hires people or he brings in other people in a lay capacity to make sure those things get accomplished. That's the sign of good leadership. So, here, Jesus might be saying to us, as our spiritual boss, we have what it takes. We maybe need to try something a little different. Other side of the boat, deeper part of the lake, calling in others to help us when the catch is so full that it's going to cause our own boat to sink. Imagine, imagine abundance in a way that says, this has to be shared. Not just this has to be hoarded. No, put it in the bank. No bury it in the field. There's stories and parables about that. What might God, what might Christ have to say to us about what we do with abundance? So all of that to help us think about in this time and in this place and in these, I hope, waning days of a pandemic, what have we learned about who we are and what we can do to use who we are? Or if we're just plain worn out, how can we invite someone else into the equation so that we're able to get the task done, able to complete the thing that needs to be completed? Or are we even able to say, this isn't really as important as I thought it was, and it's okay if it doesn't get finished? All those things are in the mix these days. And God is there to help us sort it out. And Jesus gives us a great example in today's lesson about how to look with new eyes at the same old, same old. So our invitation is to do just that, to look around, to evaluate. Maybe we've evaluated, evaluated so many times over the last several months to say, I can't do this the way it needs to be done. I can't figure out how to do it anew. Maybe it's time as a community to offer that gift, to say, I can do this. I've got some energy around this because I do it well. Is there anybody who could benefit from my gifts? 
All those things are opportunities and invitations for us to hold in our hearts, to offer before God, to listen and wait on the movement of the Spirit, and to see where that will lead us. Will our boats be sinking because we have hauled in such an amazing load of stuff when we cast our nets? Will there be something new in the nets we cast? Is it time to cast them in a different place, you know, on the lake? Is it time to take a closer look at what's coming in when we put out our nets? All those things are options and opportunities. And we are reminded that with God, all things are possible. We continue now with the Nicene Creed found on page 358 in the prayer book or on page four in our order of service. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We continue with the prayers of the people, form six, found on page 392 in the prayer book. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For those who are sick or suffering, especially the Chapman family, Jim Redinger and Linda Redinger, Amber Catron, Leonard Page, LB, Rosie, Grace, and those committed to our ongoing prayers. For those afflicted with the coronavirus, their families and communities, for those whose work puts them at risk of infection, for healthcare workers and professionals who continue to treat individuals infected by the virus, and for their families, for nursing homes, staff and residents, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, for Ian and Laura, our bishops, for the Nigerian bishops, John and Marcus. For Ann, our rector, we offer prayers of support, discernment, to the ECCT Bishop Transition Committee, 
as they undertake the work of nominating candidates for a new bishop diocese, for all bishops and other ministers, for all who serve God in his church, for the special needs and concerns of this congregation, for organizations supported by St. Peter's through mission, especially peace by peace quilters, for members of our armed forces serving at home and abroad, and for their families, especially Kenneth Fraley Jr., Richard Nutz Jr., Kevin Merrill, Jason Sarah, Jason Duvall, and Ryan Waite, for victims of natural disasters and human violence throughout the world, for communities impacted by weather-related loss and destruction, especially victims of the recent typhoon that struck the Philippines for victims of gun violence in the United States, for indigenous Asian American and Pacific Islander peoples impacted by racism, by centuries of anti-black bias, and for others seeking to undo the harm of racism and hate. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, for groups to whom we extend hospitality through the use of our building, especially Boy Scout Troop 62. For these concerns, we pray to you, O Lord. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. In our parish cycle of prayer, we give thanks that COVID infections are steadily declining for the ministry of the choir and accompanists, for parish members Dora Lee Older and Os. The Ostrowski family and Jane Barron and Ann Brown and Mark Lundy, who celebrate birthdays last week, and Andrew Barber, Randy Chapman, and Tara Fornico, who are celebrating birthdays this week, for Ann and Jim Brown, who are celebrating an anniversary this week. For well, what else are we thankful? We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We commend to your mercy all who have died in the communion of your church and those whose faith is known to you alone, including the more than 900,000 people in the United States and the more than 5.7 million people worldwide who have died of the coronavirus that they may have a peace in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. Almighty God, you made us in your image and call us to share in the renewal of this world. Inspire us to seek and serve Christ in all persons, that the proclamation of your good news in our worship, in our words, and in our work may lead us into the fullness of your love. Through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Will you please join me in reciting the Lord's Prayer, found on page 364 in the prayer book. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom.